All right, class, settle, settle, get to your seats. Let's get started. Sid, I hope you brought enough bubblegum for everyone. If not, put it away. Mr. Proselis, kindly take your seat and leave Leslie alone. She has enough trouble focusing without your help. And no, Mr. Tramp, I neither know nor care what happened to your homework. I'll just mark it not done as usual. Right, so, to review. In Unit 1 of this class, we discussed the different types of magic, which I expect you all to remember as it will be on the test. Unit 2 was a discussion of the main theme of this semester, Thaumaturgy, with a focus on Egyptian and Mesopotamian magical usage. Unit 3 was, of course, Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism. And Unit 4 presented the general history of magic from about 100 BCE to the 1800s CE. Correct? Everyone with me so far? Yes? Good? Good. No, Mr. Tramp, you may not be excused. No, no, I do not believe there is such a thing as a pencil emergency, Mr. Tramp. No, no, I'm moving on now. Please stop chewing your eraser. Now, no doubt you will recall we said we would discuss key figures in the history of magic from the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. And we will but we are also going to include one or two figures from earlier periods as well. Fortunately, if you've done the assigned reading, the list of names will be kept mercifully brief. What do you mean, what assigned reading, Sid? The assigned reading I handed out to you during the last unit, as prep for this unit. Yes, I assure you, I did assign the homework. Did no one do it? No one at all? Well, I'm afraid that's going to be some very disappointing marks for all of you come the end of the term. If you don't do the assignments, how can you expect to do well on the tests? I don't tell you these things just to hear my gums flap, now do I? No indeed, they're entirely for your benefit. Right then, to review the review and reassign the homework, which I'm sure all of you will now take careful note of by writing down the list so I won't have to repeat it or any of the information contained therein during this lesson again. Yes, with a pencil will be fine, Mr. Tramp. No, of course, of course you don't have a pencil. Why would I expect otherwise? Miss Leslie, if you could, yes, yes, thank you. Important information about the history of magic. Yes, a piece of paper for him as well. Important information about the history of magic, the items involved in magical practice, and the significant people associated with it can be found by reviewing the following resources previously covered in this class. Pencils ready. Amulet, Alchemy, Ketoblopes, Chalcedony, Dragons, Ether, Glass, Clue, Golem, Gorgon, Haunted House, Hermes, Hollow Earth, Malabranchier, Magic Potions, Marco Polo, Mirror, Oracle, Pliny, Quicksilver, Scimitar, Scroll, Spectacles, Spiritualism, Theosophy, Unicorns, Werewolf, and Zeratan. And while you're at it, you'd better review the four lessons immediately preceding this one as well. That should be enough to fill in the major gaps. You can, of course, put in some extra work and get a fuller picture, but somehow I suspect you will not. Now, I expect you to have all that read by the next time we meet. Yes, Sid, it's important. No, Mr. Proselis, there's no Cliff Notes version. You'll just have to do the work. Mr. Tramp, should I mark you absent now or hope to be pleasantly surprised on the day? I'm sorry. I'm sorry if it interferes with your dog petting schedule, Miss Leslie. You'll simply have to buckle down and do it, won't you? If you'd all done it when I told you the first time, it wouldn't seem nearly so bad now, would it? You've only yourselves to blame. No, Mr. Tramp. You won't be allowed to summon a demon to attend class for you, I'm afraid. You aren't the Faust to try it, you know. Class dismissed. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Now, presuming you've done your catch-up assignments, we can move on and look at some of the important other figures in the history of magic. And to begin with, we have to tackle a guy who probably maybe didn't even really exist. At least, 
he didn't exist in the way you've likely become familiar with. Because at some point, someone wrote a story about him that was just too good not to believe instead of the real facts. To be fair, though, because of that story, there are precious few real facts about Johann Georg Faust for a modern audience to believe in the first place. If we stick to only the information definitely known to be true, we discover that Johann Faust was born, lived for a little while, and then died. Thus ends everything that can be said with any certainty at all. If, however, you are willing to accept a little more fuzzy information about such things as dates, names, and locations, we eventually get a little further. Sometime around the rather broad period of 1466 to 1480, either Johann Faust was born in Kittlingen or Georg Faust was born in Heidelberg, Germany, or possibly the other way around. No one knows for sure, and there is equal evidence for either of those cases and several more besides. So much so that by the 17th century, hardly anyone thought he really existed at all. Although also by then, a roughly equal number of people decided he did, and in fact existed so much that they were really dealing with two different people who both fit the known facts which, as has been pointed out, were few and far between. Eventually, he went to university somewhere, probably either in a place in Bavaria called Ingolstadt or in Heidelberg itself. Again, evidence for each of those possibilities exists. He may have graduated and he may not have. It depends on which university you think he went to and whether he got a Master of Arts at Heidelberg. In any case, by 1506, which is the only really solid date involved in any of this, his life's work was underway. And just what was that life's work, you may well ask? Well, clearly, it was a reflection of his study at university. What that was was not certain, but for the next 30 years, he traveled Germany performing magic tricks and doing horoscopes and being a physician and a doctor of philosophy, an alchemist, an altogether more serious sort of magician and an astrologer. So really, your guess is as good as anyone's. Now, naturally, anyone with such wide-ranging areas of interest runs into some trouble occasionally. And so it was with Faust, whose last name might also have been Faustus, but let's leave that alone for now, shall we? At one point, he was declared a fraud by the regular authorities, and at another, he was a blasphemer in league with the devil, according to the church. Although it might just have been that he joined Protestantism. No one knows for sure. Also, the whole fraud and blasphemy thing might have been some third person pretending to be Faust in order to trick people into giving him money for doing not much of anything and thereby confusing the historical record even further and causing letters to be written to various officials across the country warning them about this Faust charlatan and both his blasphemous teaching and tendency towards sodomy. An accusation made after one of the several possible Fausts got a job teaching young boys at a school in Sickingen in 1507. In 1528, Faust revisited Ingolstadt and was banished from the city. In 1532, he was denied entry to Nuremberg on the grounds that he was a necromancer and sodomite, even though in some sectors he was praised for his abilities as a quality astrologer and physician with exceptional knowledge. And then Faust died. And as with the rest of his life, there is a certain amount of confusion over when and how and even why that might have happened. In either 1540 or 1541, an alchemical experiment he was conducting in a hotel room may have blown up in his face and killed him. Or the devil may have come to collect him personally and horribly mutilated Faust into the bargain. So much for the facts of Faust's life. In the year 1587, Johann Spies, a German printer, unleashed an anonymous chapbook upon the world christened Historia von de Johann Faust. Think Penny Dreadfuls, but with a touch less finesse. This humble booklet laid bare all the supposed sins of Faust and kick-started the literary Faustian tradition. Soon after, Christopher Marlowe, a playwright you might have overlooked in your high school readings while being bored to death with Shakespeare, translated the tales into English, and released the play The Tragical History of Dr. Faustus upon the unsuspecting stage. 
Before Shakespeare stole the limelight, Marlowe was hailed as the creme de la creme of playwrights, and his Faustus play took Elizabethan theaters by storm. True to the Faustian spirit, multiple versions of the play were concurrently gracing the stage within a few short years. So popular was it that by the 17th century, the play, featuring as it did both comedy and tragedy, was reintroduced to Germany, where it gained new popularity for both itself and the older tales of Faust all over again. In the play, which is now the prototype for all deal-with-the-devil-type stories, including those that star up-and-coming blues guitarists, Johann Faust is so eager to increase his already impressive knowledge in the fields of astrology, medicine, and magic that he conjures up a devil named Mephistopheles, which is where that name comes from. At least, he thinks he has conjured him, although Mephisto insists that he came all on his own initiative and can do nothing on his own, but must first check in with Lucifer. Faust sends him off to confer after quizzing him about hell and its workings, and when Mephistopheles returns, they make a pact whereby in exchange for 24 years of service from Mephisto, Faust agrees to trade his body and soul. Faust is given a poodle, yes, a poodle, and it, along with his servant named Christoph Wagner, accompany him to keep an eye on him during his upcoming adventures. Item number one. On the big list of things it was really worth making a pact with the devil for that Faust really, really wants is a wife. At which point Mephisto reveals just what sort of D&D campaign we are in here by declining to grant the wish on the grounds that marriage is just a sham. So no, no wife for you. So instead, Faust settles on wishing for several books of knowledge and receives exactly one. Now as the story unfolds, Faust starts suspecting he might have made a devilish blunder and contemplates seeking divine intervention. Cue the by now traditional angelic duo who sit on his shoulder and try to sway Faust. But Lucifer, ever the showman, pops in just to remind everyone of the blood-signed contract. In a grand spectacle featuring the seven deadly sins, Lucifer convinces Faust to forsake divine assistance and continue reveling in his worldly pursuits. Mephisto and Faust then head out on a grand tour of Europe. The grand tour initially takes on a touristy vibe, with Faust riding a wine barrel down a Leipzig river, causing a vino eruption at a local bar, and continuing the revelry in various different establishments. But then they show up in Rome, and Faust is called before the Pope, where he conjures up Alexander the Great and his lover, torments a knight for being a heckler, and then wanders off to play tricks on a horse dealer before dropping in on a sultan in Constantinople and arriving unannounced in the court of the Kaiser in Innsbruck. So much fun is being had by Faust that he hardly notices that 16 years of his contract have slipped by. When it does dawn on him, he wants out of the contract, but Mephistopheles convinces Faust to go through with it by conjuring up no less than Helen of Troy, whom Faust promptly shows his etchings to and fathers a son named Justice. The 24 years of the contract having finally elapsed, Faust is informed that he will be taken by Satan on the next night. Faust throws a banquet, tells all his friends to repent and remain pious, and then at midnight, after going to bed, all his guests hear a terrible noise from his room, which they ignore until morning. When they do investigate, Faust is unmistakably dead, with brains on the walls, body below in the courtyard, and eyes sitting solo in the middle of the room. You can sort of see why this version was more popular than Faust's actual life, can't you? Now, that's all well and good, but it doesn't really help explain how Faust fits in with our history of magic and what makes him such an important figure that he gets practically the whole episode to himself. Starting about 1501, a number of magical grimoires were published by Faust that contained magical instructions for accomplishing particular feats. These books were quite the thing, just the sorts of guides to magic that anyone taking up the practice might need to really get things done and make an impression on the magical community. 
Among the titles Faust published were such classical magical texts as 1501's Ghost Command, Notes on White and Black Magic for Summoning and Commanding Ghosts, Dr. Faust's Fourfold Compulsion to Hell, used to make the residents of Hell obey your commands, 1505's The Black Kabbalah of Dr. Johann Faust, which is exactly as you might think, dark magic not found in the regular Kabbalah, Egyptian Necromancy from 1520, Johann Faust's Hell Force Manual, which sounds like the worst idea for a Super Saiyan team ever, Faust's Miraculous Art and Miracles book, which sounds like magic for kids, Dr. Faust's Great and Powerful Internal Force, no comment, and the winner of the award for the magic book with the longest and most specific title, Dr. Faust's Large and Powerful Sea Spirit, in which Lucifer and three sea spirits are summoned to retrieve treasure from the waters, which was written by Faust and came out in 1692, no less than 150 years after the man had already died. Which is, of course, the problem with the whole batch of grimoires. None of them were actually written by Faust. None of them even came out while Faust was still alive. None of them, in fact, came out when they said they came out, because, you see, actual Faust was long gone. But Faust, the character remained so popular after the Marlowe plays that you could just slap his name on anything even vaguely magical and sell it to those people who believed that magical demon summoning and talking to ghosts and necromancy and fortune telling and alchemy were real and expect to earn a small fortune. Several came out in the late 16th century during the German folk book tradition, but several others came out as late as the 18th century still purporting to be actual texts by the actual Dr. Faust. Even today, they are still reprinted and promoted as actual magical texts, even in the face of literal centuries of evidence that they do not work. And that is Faust's legacy and contribution to the history of magic. Getting a bunch of people, well-known people in some cases, worked up about magic enough to think that it might be true and might actually work and maybe could give you access to power and fulfill wishes. Of course, that misses the point of what the Faust story was really all about. The Faustian myth, popularized by Christopher Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, serves as a stark reminder to exercise caution and prudence when delving into the uncharted territories of knowledge. The narrative underscores the potential perils that accompany an unbridled thirst for understanding, especially during a pivotal era fading dark ages and the burgeoning renaissance marked by the dawn of vast new realms of knowledge. The Faustian myth urges individuals to approach the future with circumspection, acknowledging the complexities and moral dilemmas that may arise in the relentless pursuit of enlightenment. It serves as a timeless allegory, cautioning against rash and unchecked ambitions, emphasizing the importance of navigating the path to knowledge with mindful deliberation. But not only that, Faust also serves as a very important archetype. But more on that later. Thanks for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. I trust you found it not only entertaining, but perhaps even sagged a couple of intriguing nuggets of information. Your presence here adds that extra dash of awesomeness to the mix. If you want to cast a spell of support, head over to buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback to make both one-time and ongoing pledges. Embark on this journey with us, and together, let's make each episode an enchanting adventure. Don't just listen. Participate. Your magical touch awaits at buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback. Let the quest for knowledge continue. Except, you know, at a reasonable, well-measured pace, and absolutely no meeting with a mysterious stranger at Crossroads. This episode comes to you from Fiddleback Productions, researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey. For a treasure trove of additional episodes, visit gmordoftheweek.com. 
Music is provided by Blue Dot Sessions, home of minimalist acoustic music for production and pleasure. Visit them at sessions.blue. The stars move still. Time runs. The clock will strike.